Hello everyone, uh, this is Solomon and uh, with my colleague Frank will present our thesis uh, Smart Without Slum in Kilimani, Mozambique and our thesis is supervised by Professor Massimo Tadi and uh, so this uh, presentation has five main sections it begins with the introduction followed by investigation, formulation, uh, modification and lastly we have the retrofitting uh, Smart Without Slum focuses on the often neglected uh, medium-sized cities, specifically in the case of Africa. Uh, we started our thesis work by understanding the definition of slums and UN Habitat puts five characteristics to identify slum settlements such as uh, insecure residential status, both structural quality of houses and overcrowding. And when we see the global share of slums, Africa has the highest uh, percentage with 65% followed by Asia and Latin America. And again, when we zoom to African continent, the sub-Saharan Africa region has the highest urban population living in slum areas. And when we, we can mention also Nigeria, Mozambique, and South Africa as an example. And why we choose the Kilimane, uh, well, we have several reasons. Uh, the climate risk uh, map indicates Mozambique is one of the most exposed country of all climate risk. And three quarters of the urban population lives in slums. Uh, and when we see the GDP is very low, only for $99. And six out of ten cities in Mozambique are on coastal areas. And moreover, when we see the Kilimane uh, at glance, informal settlement is increasing, and different funders skipped uh, Kilimane, and it is a medium sized city with about 400,000 inhabitants. Kilimani has many street sites and buildings, also natural resources such as uh, water scapes. Cycling is a culture in Kilimani, plus uh, carnivals and events are frequent activities. Uh, the city is also vibrant, however, slums are problem in the city. The local construction uses wood, bamboo and palm trees with traditional knowledge. And the city is also a port for Mozambique, but sadly, flooding is frequently affects the life of the inhabitants. We also study the climate of Kilimani, such as the dry bulb temperature, relative humidity, solar radiation, wind, and rainfall. And to construct our thesis, we have used IMM methodology, since it is holistic, multi-layer, and multi-scale approach. And we explored an integrated approach to investigate the city of Kilimani as a complex adaptive system. Then we have developed prototype projects from IMM and SDGs, or the Sustainable Development Goals from the UN. As we know, IMM has four different but fully integrated phases. On phase one, we did horizontal and vertical investigation followed by performance evaluation, and on phase two, uh, we identify the weakest catalyst and arrange the DOPs or the design ordering principles. And on the third phase, we uh, do the intervention on both city and local scale or the barrio scale. And at last, we did the retrofitting. Here we have a main phase one. And in this case, we define the perimeter of the study area on the city scale level. Uh, we have included 28 barrios or neighborhoods out of uh, 54 barrios in the whole city of Kilimane. And uh, we started with horizontal investigation and we studied the density of the city from the volume map and the type of users map also helped us to understand the concentration and distribution of key functions such as educational, commercial and parks. We also seen the open spaces in the city using the void map and identify the transportation coverage in the city by the transportation map. Uh, the transportation map also shows the models, modal split and more than 50% of the people uh, using cycling or walking. The next step uh, was the vertical investigation and the policy map helped us to locate the high story buildings in the city and are highly concentrated as the downtown. The proximity map also helps us uh, um, to see the quality of movement by the walking and higher proximity of the functions were noticed in the city center. Uh, diversity map is also overlay between void and type of uses 
and we categorize uh, key functions into necessary regular, necessary optional, and optional activities. The downtown has high concentration of necessary optional activities, and the effectiveness map is uh, the efficiency of transportation coverage over the existing volumes. In this manner, the purple areas are effective compared to the yellow uh, shade. And here we can see the accessibility areas using public transport from the accessibility map. It is noticed highly on the road junctions. And on the right side, we have the interface map, which is a superimposition between transportation and voyage. It also helps us to understand the connectivity between uh, the existing roads. And we have, or we can see uh, from the map that the city center has a better interface compared to the rest of or the periphery of the city. And finally, we have the second level of superimposition, which are the compactness, complexity, and connectivity. It is obtained by overlaying two maps for vertical investigation, and improving these three maps would give a robust city. After the investigation, we move to select an intervention area for detailed study using these three parameters roof structure, overcrowding, and poor services. Uh, we have identified the existing roof structure in the city as good condition, partly rusted and rusted. And secondly, we studied the population density for each barrios as high, medium, and low density. And the white ones are the one without uh, any information. And finally, we selected barrio 9 in Lebanon. Uh, however, for this presentation, we focus on the Barrio 11. And this is a Barrio scale investigation. Uh, so uh, the volume map shows 74% less volume compared to the expected. To get this expected volume percentage, we used 30 square meter per person by referring the UN habitats. Similarly, the type of users map indicates 81% lesser functions compared to the average value of the functions in the city. On the other hand, transport map shows 20% better value compared to the average transportation coverage in the city. Uh, but again, void map shows 26% lesser void compared to the city's average void value. Then we move to vertical investigation and the policy map is 33% lesser than uh, when compared to the expected value. However, proximity map shows 156% better than the average value of the city. Uh, the diversity map indicates some necessary occasional activities concentrated in the lower part of Barrio 11. We can also see the effectiveness map being lesser by 20, 89% when compared to the balanced transport coverage in the city. Uh, the information on accessibility map shows all functions are accessible by the existing transportation coverage and also the interface map is 156% better than the average value of the city. At last, uh, we have the permeability and directness map and directness map shows the direct and frequent routes used by the people. The second phase is formulation. Uh, we started this phase by identifying the weakest catalyst, one from vertical investigation and one from horizontal investigation. So effectiveness and type of uses were the weakest catalysts in Barrio 11. Uh, the next step was arranging the design in order in principles. In this case, we have provided a point-based arithmetic calculation. Uh, the DOPs are arranged horizontally and the key categories were arranged vertically then the average point was obtained. Based on this calculation, uh, we obtained green space uh, in the first place, followed by food management, cyclability and workability, and ground use, and the other DOPs. Uh, and this diagram shows the arrangement of DOPs based on the calculation and their priority. And after the DOPs arrangement, we try to connect the different dots. We have the WEMF, uh, from the SDG or Sustainable Develop Development Goals, uh, which stands for water, waste, energy, mobility, food, and housing. And we have DOP, and at last we have SMART. SMART uh, is a thematic approach developed for this thesis. 
which stands for uh, soft multilayer agriculture robust and technology so this is the interrelationship between uh, WEMF and we have the DOPs and their indicator relationship and we have the WEMF and the DOP relationship and we have the SMART and WEMF relationship and at last we have all of them interrelated to each other in order to have the prototype projects uh, based on SMART and as an, this is the uh, SMART uh, uh, listed with their prototype projects uh, for example, we have soft and multi-layer as an example. So soft uh, is directly related to mobility and green network would be the prototype project. On the other hand, multi-layer is directly related to housing and services. So we choose affordable housing as prototype project. And again, we have the smart, which is applied from uh, city scale to barrio scale in our study areas. Investigations and formulations helped us to come up with interventions for different skills of the city and we'll start off with the city skills intervention. Now at the city skill intervention what we decided to do was to drain and link the city and this was achieved through prototype projects such as the city park, the green, green belt, the green networks, and then finally, the CHAPA and Cycle Rapid Transit System. Linking the city, we start off looking at the CHAPA system where we looked at prioritizing the CHAPAs on the main street so that they could be able to stop within the main street and then pick up passengers whilst allowing other passers-by to be able to drive past. And so the street has been engineered to allow for on-street stopping while still allowing for movement of other vehicles that are passing by. Then the next thing we looked at was the green, the green streets. Within these green streets, what we chose to do was to speak with the owners of houses that existed within highly concentrated areas of business activity and help with the introduction of shops in front of their houses. Now this idea is to help to be able to create multiple levels of activities on top of the street such that we can help people to be able to stop and chat and also provide streets that are multi-leveled with activity. Then on the green belt, we chose to provide a way of draining the city and keeping water away from entering the city. And so in a typical scenario for this to actually happen, we would have to move certain houses from their locations. Then what we chose to do was to excavate portions of the land and then use that as a refill on the other end. Then now we are able to simulate an actual situation of the flood and then the pre-flood, post-flood. Now within the city park, we looked at creating a park that has and is able to either feed people or create jobs for the people that will be within the city that can volunteer for the city parks activities. And so we can be creating around 150 jobs, new jobs completely, or even looking at providing around 2,000 meals for two months. Now the city ponds also tend to complement this city parks that are there and also serve as a way of draining the whole city whenever there are actual floods that could happen within the city. Now from here, we move to the barrier skills intervention. At the barrier scale, we now focused on how we achieve the smartness directly within the barrio. First of all, within the barrio, we looked at softening the barrio. And we did this by the introduction of the main street spine, which was going to house different activities at different times of the day. And so the same street just changes in activities during the day and is able to multi-layer different activities for the people. Then the next thing was to look at how to multi-layer the place. Now, because we had already introduced the green, the green belt on the city scale, this was going to affect the locations of houses that were within the vulnerable areas. Well, to consider and, and work on this issue, what the team did was to look at a proposal where houses that were of na natures that needed upgrading or improvement would look into negotiations with the mayor where these negotiations would allow the 
his houses to accept people who are moving in from houses that are affected by the demolition activities. And then this, in turn, would help us to be able to improve the houses of the existing people whilst being able to find new accommodation for the people affected. Then we want to look at the architecture of the barrio. Now, in terms of architecture, we looked at first introducing beehives, which would serve to us educational purposes by allowing people to be able to see the importance of bees and their production, whilst also producing bees within the city. Communal gardens, where people could also look at the production of farm garden and garden uh, plants, which could actually help to increase the food production and then reduce the food shortages around. Then, with relation to water and the robustness of the city, we came up with the idea of communal boreholes instead of going for individual boreholes. This idea was more looked at because we saw the importance of doing a communal borehole because in cities around the world, which also existed around coastlines, just like Kilimani, what was very common around these areas was that the people's activities such as digging up individual boreholes have contributed to the gradual and quick sink, sinking of their city. cities like Jakarta uh, New Mexico cities are great examples of what happens when your natural aquifers are reducing in quantity. And the effect is generally that the sinking of the city moves at a far faster pace. And so to avoid this problem and mitigate this whole situation, what the team considered to do was to look at the introduction of communal boreholes instead of individual boreholes. Now, these communal boreholes also help in the sense that they reduce the number of positions and locations that are used to extract water, water from the natural aquifers of the city. And their locations were also within four minutes distances from the neighboring houses. Now, the next thing was to look at how to refill these aquifers, because as we take them through the communal boreholes, we should look at how to refill them to avoid the future sinking. And this was achieved with the use of permeable street networks within the barrio. Now, the use of permeable street networks will now help us to be able to in increase the water that can be stored in our natural aquifers. Then, finally, the technology that we wanted to bring into the barrio, making the barrio a tech-savvy one. Well, tech-savviness for us was looked at in the a way of providing to the people of the community ways of improving the technology that they had as of now. And so popular was the bike. And so we introduced the bike cafe and also looked at the com communal farming cafes. These two ideas are meant to be places of sharing ideas and places of sale that would help people to be able to improve their knowledge and their skills in terms of the technologies used in these various activities. And all these projects, small, small projects, are what can be put together to make this barrio a very smart one. Zooming into the site, we design our smart house. Well, how smart will it be? Well, to achieve this, we first wanted it to be smart, but then it had to be modular and self-built and low cost and improve on the quality of the life of the people. And this would be achieved using the local crafts, the modular self-building techniques that can exist, the container upcycling that exists in the city, and then also trying to improve on the comfort of the people that would be living in these houses. In terms of low cost, the main considerations was expandability, the lightweightness of the whole construction, and finally, the provision of essential items in the house. To start off, we looked at the provision of two major containers, which could be split into positions, and then the split positioning, which is going to allow us to be able to get an upper floor space, which could be used for an upper space for the expansion for the upper house, whilst the lower floor space is also expandable for the house that is up there. And so when the whole house expands, we have the people also expanding with it house as well. Well, how smart then 
is this low cost house that we've mentioned. Well, in terms of softness, this house is able to allow the use of bicycles by allowing the actual parking spaces for bicycles. So it takes into consideration these things and also allows people to be able to communicate and meet the others who house they live in the house. In terms of multi-layeredness, we looked at how it allows the expansion at your own self-paced manner. Then the multi-layeredness of this design also comes in the form of its ability to adapt into different forms and different functions, as we can see, alternating from bedroom to adaptation to the kitchen adaptations or the combinations of outdoor living and shopping activities. All these are things that could be achieved using the multi-layered design that was considered from the very beginning. In terms of architecture, we looked at outdoor gardening and then also indoor gardening for herbs that could be used within the house during the rainy seasons of the, the climate of Kilimani. Then the robustness, being well aware of the continuous floods and then continuous heavy rains, we made sure that the houses were raised above certain plane height and also to allow that we have a lot of green spaces that could actually drain off naturally the overflow of water that would be coming into these areas. And finally, the excess water that was going to come into these areas were not also left to waste, but some of them is also integrated into the design through the production of water story tanks that are added to the design from the very beginning. Then, in terms of technology, we looked at the use of solar power for the production of energy within the houses. With the house now designed, we now had to look at how to arrange these houses on the site to allow as much contact between people and communication as much as possible so as not to alienate the people that live there. And so we looked at different housing arrangement layouts that, and their effects on the temperatures outside and how they could actually allow for people to have more and more communication within these periods. And we noticed that the different layouts, although good, had their own advantages. And so in the final layout we chose, which was the stacked layout, we were able to achieve the positives of the different layouts that were mentioned. And in this final layout, we see the integration of our green spaces and all the houses put together. Now, for this to happen, it would have to go through a number of processes, which would be the first the identification of houses that could be demolished. Then the next will be to look at the creation of foundation parts that would house the later to come containers that would start up the whole community of new smart houses. How do we improve the quality of life? And this is something we try to achieve using the thermal comfort modules, the night's discomfort, and then the overheating periods parameters. And these guidelines were all based on the SIPSE overheating guidelines and also the ASHRAE, as well as also more advice on the adaptive model coming from the EN15251. To start off, we first had to look at our base model, which happened to be the typical construction approach, which is just metal or the wood base combined together based of the containers and the lightweight construction as compared to the ASHRAE standard of what should be used in these kind of buildings. And we noticed that from the very beginning onwards, the energy breakdown from our building has a lot of losses and um, heat uh, gains that we could actually look at reducing and which could help us move into the ASHRAE's recommendation. And so to do this, we would have to make these adjustments 
and we needed to be able to first of all decide on which of the rooms was most affected by affected by the by these discomforts and then use that as our sample space to benchmark the building's improvements as we moved forward. But before we started benchmarking the building, we would first have to come up with the schematic design to understand a big overview of all the things that we wanted to achieve within the building. And with that said and done, we now started looking at these in a systematic way. Insulating the building was the first step. Now, insulating the whole building gave us a number of effects, and we noticed from the very beginning that there was a very similar effect in the thickness of insulation from 0 0.75 and 0 0.2, 0 0.1 centimeter thickness of insulation, which were all having very similar thermal comfort properties, um, effect, sorry, uh, also with the overheating. And so with that, we were able to settle on the 75 centimeter thick insulation around the envelope of the building. The next was to look at alternations of the roof, which we saw as important because of the location of the sites away from the earth. And this also showed us that we could actually improve on the, the roof structure by, act, by adding up um, extra layer of insulation as well as the addition of some air layers. And this is what we see to have improved the whole building as a whole. Concerning the, concerning the ventilation of the whole facade, we decided to look at different thicknesses of air layers around the building. And as the air layers were increasing up until 80 centimeters of air layer, we noticed that the building was responding more positively. And so we chose the 80 centimeter thick air layer. Now, Windows were the other things that were contributing to the gains of the energy breakdown. But then windows cannot be considered in isolation without considering its effects its effect on the ASE and then the SDA. And so as we considered this in terms of shading, we also made sure we looked at these parameters as well. First of all, we had to decide the types, the sizes of shading that we'll be using. And the first analysis showed that if shading only one third of the windows was not the best of solutions. And so we had to move on to increasing the shading that could be used on the windows. So we went for the medium arrangement, but then shading the full window. However, during the analysis, we noticed that Using wood for full shading was good for the ASE, whilst it was also reducing our SDA, which was also a disadvantage. But then we noticed a positive on using reflective material for the shading device would have given a very balanced feel on both the SDA and ASE. So then it brought us to a point where we asked ourselves, what next? Well, at this point, we had achieved something that was going to improve on the, the quality of spaces, but then we also wanted to improve on the views of the people as they moved outside. And so we looked at a new shading, which would look at one third of the window, allowing for visual connection, whilst the two thirds would shade the window and protect it from the negative effects of the sun during the day. Now, from there, we are now going to look at how we tested out the ventilation on the building. The first was to look at natural ventilation at night. Now, ventilating the building at night, we assumed that the only one third of the window would allow for ventilation at night and then during the day, we assume that the whole windows will be open for ventilation. And it had a very drastic effect on the night cooling, the night uh, sleep discomfort, as well as the daytime comfort as well. And so we noticed that ventilation was a very key factor in improving the thermal comfort of the building. 
So in all, we can see a final energy breakdown of the whole processes that have taken place. First, we insulated the building and it reduced the heat gains through the opaque facade. Then the next, again, was extra opaque adjustments. Then the shading, which also reduced the gains through the windows. And finally, the natural ventilation, which was also added. And we see how close we have gotten to the ASHRAE standard that was recommended from the very beginning. And so these simulations and analysis was what helped us to finalize on the details and construction layers of the different parts of the building and the major corners of the building that we used in the end. Now, how was the self-build part of the construction actually going to happen? Well, first of all, we looked at making sure that the structure would stand in itself. So we try to understand the direction to face the building to reduce the wind pressures that would affect the building. Then with the wind pressures established, where we realized the wind pressures were not too much of an effect than the actual uh, loads that's come up from the top, the gravitational loads of the, the structure, we rather focused on these loads other than the wind loads for our car structural calculations. And from there, we were able to size and design the different wooden wood sections that will be used for our light frame construction. Within the construction sequence here, we get to see how when the construction process starts from the very beginning with a single container, with the addition of an extra container, and then the addition of the, the toilet modules, then the frames that make up the structure. And then with this, we have the beginning house. But then when someone wants to expand either from the bottom, we can use the lightweight construction modules or from the top, when he wants to also expand, he also gets the chance to use the lightweight construction modules. And in all, we notice that these things are done with modular parts that come up to give us the whole building, as you can see displayed in this section of the presentation. And so the house in all comes off to look in this manner. So the last phase in IMM is retrofitting, but before we continue, let me explain the living building challenge that we use to achieve uh, for our design. Uh, the living building challenge is a performance standard for buildings framed by people around the world to create spaces that, uh, like a flower, give more than they take. Uh, so it has seven petals, and the goal is to create living buildings that incorporate regenerative uh, design solutions. Uh, here, for example, we achieve the limits of growth by creating 15 meters of buffer from the wetlands. Uh, we also achieved urban agriculture, habitat exchange, and human-powered uh, living. Uh, and we also partly achieved a positive water requirement by providing water system to the barrios. Uh, also, civilized environment and healthy interior environment were achieved, and the details were explained uh, in the previous section. Uh, we also uh, try to achieve biophilic environment by creating visual connection between uh, indoors and outdoors and the use of containers also helped us to achieve the embodied carbon footprint. Uh, however, the red list and responsible industry were not achieved. Lastly, except from 1718, we try to partly and fully achieve uh, the rest of the imperatives of the living building challenge. Now we will see uh, the city scale and barrio scale retrofitting. So we begin with the city scale retrofitting and it is difficult to see the chain between the old and the new volume up until we see the uh, barrio scale. Um, and regarding the type of users map, uh, we have included additional functions along the city park and the green belt, so it is improved. Mm. Here we have the uh, before and after void map and as you can see we have integrated more void uh, area across the city park and the green belt so it has been improved. The new transportation map also shows the newly added transport modes and the city has better transportation coverage now. Uh, regarding the porosity, uh, the new map shows added levels across the city. Uh, the newly added uh, type of uses along the city park and the green belt has improved the proximity map when compared to uh, the old one. Uh, 
uh, we can't really see uh, a change on the diversity map because of uh, the scale uh, but uh, it has uh, a slight uh, improvement uh, the new effectiveness map clearly indicates the increased efficiency of transportation coverage over the existing volumes and uh, on the new map it has uh, notified or clearly shown with uh, purple colors uh, since we integrated uh, new transportation nodes uh, the accessibility map has also improved uh, uh, dramatically after the city scale retrofitting we did the retrofitting for barrio 11 here we have the volume and type of use maps uh, regarding the volume uh, map uh, we have uh, relocated significant amount of volumes from the flood zone to more safer zone moreover uh, there are newly added functions uh, the new transport map of barrio 11 shows the newly added road spines to connect the fragmented routes together with the transportation stops as of the void map we included more open spaces like community gardens and the green buffer which makes uh, map better than the previous one uh, because of the relocation of houses from the flood zone the porosity of barrio 11 has changed and also the quality of walking in barrio 11 has improved due to uh, the new uh, functions added at last we have uh, diversity and effectiveness maps uh, the diversity map didn't show significant change however the efficiency of transportation coverage in barrio 11 has uh, increased and thank you so much for your time